see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Hi, it's Edwin Rutsch from the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, and today I'm here with Michael Kimball, who is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Northern California. So thank you very much, Michael, for uh, joining me to talk about how to build a culture of empathy. Thanks, Edwin. I make one small correction. It's University of Northern Colorado. Oh. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm in the mountain states here. <laughs> Oh, great. Um, yeah, that's, uh, so um, the way I, I found out about you was, um, let me just check the audio here, was that you, I, I found a video uh, of a talk you gave, uh, it was called Recovering Empathy, and it looks like it was from 2007. Mm -hmm. So it was really kind of like your exploration and discussion about uh, uh, empathy, which I thought was a you know, really interesting talk. Yes, um, that was um, it. Was an inaugural lecture for the uh, for UNC. We call it UNC, even though on the East Coast that means um, that means North Carolina. Here it means Northern Colorado. Um, it was uh, the it's an endowed chair position called Robert O. Schultz Chair in Interdisciplinary Studies. It's a one year position, and so um, that was the uh, that was what I was hired to do for that year, and it involved uh, presenting a public talk, and I had been. Um, thinking a lot about empathy and its relationship to um, to being human. As an anthropologist, um, I'm interested in what it, what it means to be human and, and where we came from uh, and what our potential is. And so it seemed appropriate after, you know, the, the aftershocks of 9-11, to really be revisiting that topic and thinking, um, thinking more deeply about it. Um, and I didn't know at the time, though, that that there was um, a bit of a groundswell going on of interest in empathy. And then later on, President Obama mentioned it, you know, and and it seemed like it was something that's um, that was in in sort of the collective consciousness, um, probably something that had always been in the collective unconscious. And so it was very timely to be uh, to be kind of putting that together at that time. Um, plus, I was coming from a university. Well, University of Maine at Machias, which is in uh, in the state of Maine, and um, I had been collaborating with a filmmaker on a documentary about community, and there was a scene in that documentary which I show in the in the little video, which is a sort of a narrated version of this of the talk that I gave, um, a scene of uh, just un a very surprising scene in which a a, a sort of a vagrant uh, man um, just shows up in front of the camera. Um, puts his face right there, if, you know, a few inches from the lens, and and says this in sl in a slurred, you know, voice says this thing about uh, what happens when you don't have community, and I thought that was incredibly poignant. And then he he left the frame and disappeared, um, but it caught my attention, and it usually caught the viewers' attentions when they saw that because it wasn't planned, entirely impromptu. He shows up, he says something wise, and then disappears. <laughs> and so, uh, in my in my talk on empathy, on recovering empathy, I thought that was an important um, kind of linchpin for for the themes in the talk. Yeah. So yeah, it, around there's a kind of a movement uh, building, I think, for empathy. A lot of science and and uh you know other fields are you know kind of starting to talk about it and mm -hmm. uh, i think you know that was like a very early kind of very early stage there 2007. yeah you know, it was exactly just kind of getting kind of rolling so it seems like you have your finger on the pulse right for whatever reason it just seemed like something that uh, needed to be said and and, and a, an issue that needed to be raised so um, and it did seem to strike a chord with people in the audience. Uh, it was a great way to establish rapport because um, I think everybody, or many people anyway, on some level, wonder about this thing. And um, some of them, you know, I think depending on your ideology, uh, depending on your own experience, um, it can be a threatening concept too. Empathy can be can be sort of a threatening idea. And so, regardless of of how we approach it or how we start to think about it, it's still it's still engaging. Well, there will be a link to uh, the video uh, from this right. video, so I would recommend anyone watching this go to uh, maybe even watch that video first or afterwards, either way. Sure, sure, um, that sounds great. 
So uh, kind of what I wanted to talk about is how do we build a culture of empathy? Um, you know, I'm kind of through the Center for Building a Culture of Empathy, really seeing if we can't start a, a movement, you know, a, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, to deepen the value of empathy uh, within society. And, you know, one, one way I, I found that I kind of enjoy with these uh, interviews is to ask people about a metaphor for empathy. Mm -hmm. You know, so we have like a pictorial image of it. And uh, often empathy is actually defined as a metaphor of standing in someone else's shoes mm -hmm. and looking mm -hmm. through someone else's eyes. And for me, empathy is like a cornucopia. Mm -hmm. you know, there's this richness of experience that we gain uh, through uh, empathy mm. and kind of opening up our world. So I'm wondering if you have a metaphor of, for you, what is empathy like? If you had a kind of a, uh, uh, a pictorial image. Sure. Yes, uh, I think I do. Um, let me preface this a little bit by saying that <clears throat> when uh, you first made contact with me and talked about the uh, the question of, how do you build a culture of empathy? I had a um, it, it caused me some pause because I hadn't thought of a I th hadn't thought of a culture of empathy before. I, I thought of empathy as a as a way that we connect with other people um, across difference of one kind or another. <clears throat> but I had never thought of a culture. And and as an anthropologist, to tell you the truth, it troubled me um, thinking about this idea because culture, of course, is you know, one of those debated or controversial notions anyway. And my definition of culture um, tends not to accommodate um, something that would be that specific. You know what I mean? So, so I, it really, I was really glad you put it that way because it, it gave me an opportunity to really think again more deeply about, about what that would look like or what it, what it would mean. And, but then you, you sort of qualify by that, that by saying, um, you know, how do we grow or increase empathy in society as a whole? And that was a little, I was a little more comfortable with that idea um, because what that made me think is, I like to think about things in evolutionary terms because uh, um, I was trained as an archaeologist um, and I've been doing archaeology and applied anthropology for quite a while now. Um, as a teacher, um, my job is to um, present students with the tools allow them to play with them, the perspectives and the tools of anthropology so that they can see the world from multiple perspectives, uh, not just the one that they came in with. Um, and, uh, and so it gives them an opportunity to play around with different notions of how people see the world, different worldviews, and, and try to have empathy um, for these different perspectives that people might have. Um, so I started thinking about an evolutionary perspective on it. And I realized that, you know, the reason... I mean, of course, the reason we have culture, that we have the capacity for culture, is because it's helped us survive as a species, you know, for, for quite some time. I mean, at least 200,000 years as an anatomically modern Homo sapien, and then well before that as pre-human kinds of uh, um, um, versions. So, so I started thinking, you know, what, what does culture do for us, of course? And, it, and it's a survival kit. You know, it's a, it's a, a it's a collection of values and practices um, that we share with each other, transmit down through generations and so forth. So if it's a set of tools, um, and one of the tools in the kit is empathy, um, what are the other ones? Um, because you can't just have one. You know, you, if you, you can do well with a screwdriver, but not, not when you need a hammer. Um, and so, you know, I think that, and I won't do a metaphor about which tool uh, empathy would be. I haven't gone there yet, and I'm not going to try to be extemporaneous on that one, but um, <laughs> but it seems like we need to talk about a kit rather than uh, rather than a one tool kind of thing. Um, so <clears throat> I started thinking, you know, the other tools in the kit are sometimes in direct contradiction to empathy. Um, antipathy is a tool in the kit, really. Excuse me, <clears throat> because in some cases we are being threatened, and we need to protect ourselves and staying completely open um, and vulnerable at all times to understanding another person's perspective can sometimes put us in danger. Um, so I think that empathy is one of the tools in the kit that we evolved as a species to, to survive in different contexts. Um, and so the idea of a culture of empathy troubled me a little bit because I thought, you know, how do you make room for some of the other things that we definitely still require? But then I started thinking, um, and I still agree with that perspective, but I, but, but I need to, to add to that that um, 
the world has changed. You know, we're living in a very globalized world now where we're bumping up against people with different belief systems and different ways of, of thinking about things and acting in the world. And uh, in the, the old way of living in a sort of tribal society where um, you did okay to, to have your territory and to protect it and to, um, to have some kind of commerce with other groups, but if you, if you got into conflict and survived, um, the world just went on the way, the way it had gone on. You know, you, there's a tragedy and you sing songs about it down through the generations. Um, you know, battles were, were fought and battles were lost and won and that kind of thing. And that's where all our great epics come from and, and so forth. Um, but nowadays we live in a world where that can, um, I mean, we, we really have the potential to wipe ourselves off the face of the planet. So really it's, a, it's not a, we can't talk about a balance between the two anymore. We really do, I think, need to be focusing more on the empathy part um, in order to survive as a species and to, and to have our planet survive. Uh, because empathy, you know, extends beyond our feeling for each other as humans, but it goes into the non-human world as well. Um, so, so I thank you for that, that phrase that you used because it gave me an opportunity to really explore it and, and, and put it into my own perspective and in the terms that I'm used to dealing with. Um, so back to your question. That was a long preface. But no, that was great because <laughs> I, I feel like I'm talking to the right person about this terminology with uh, okay. culture. So this is okay. really, so I really like to explore it from all sides. So I'm really yeah. appreciating this. Well, it, it's a, to me, it's very important for us to um, to complicate our ideas about culture, because the old way of looking at it is is really um, a box or a set of boxes, and you have a a person in your hand with, wearing a certain kind of clothing and speaking a certain kind of language, and you have to figure out: Do I put it in that box? That person in that box, or do I put him or her in that box? That's culture A. That's culture B. You know, that's kind of an old older way of looking at things because um, we defined people by traits. <clears throat> you know. Entire groups of people were defined by their traits, and that's a dangerous proposition because it can go beyond clothing and language and into moral character and intelligence and this, you know, some really perilous notions about what, what it is for a group, a group's identity or what what identity we're assigning to a group. So we've moved beyond that, you know, in anthropology and, and in other fields to really understand um, culture as something that comes from the bottom up, that it emerges through human interaction. And as people interact with each other, they develop a sense of connection with each other that's based on shared values and shared ideas and shared practices. But they can also share different things with different people. And so they can be full participants in multiple cultures just by being just by virtue of being alive in this world, in this social world that we live in. So really when you're when you're trying to call something a culture, you really in my view anyway, you really need to to have that described to you by the person that you're talking with and by the people that you're interacting with. That's where culture emerges, um, rather than defining yourself and imposing it, you know, on on a group or or, or imposing it as an idea on a uh, on a society. So so again, I, I'm grateful that you raised that um, that question and that that kind of prompt because it uh, it really does um, it really does. Uh, articulate with with some of the ideas that we have in anthropology of what it is and and it, and it asks us to to, to um, explore uh, those kinds of things more deeply so um, now back to the metaphor. Yeah, the metaphor we do have a bit of a metaphor you had the metaphor of it being one of the tools in the toolbox of, that's so right. that's we have our first metaphor yeah um, and I've thought also about it in other ways too um, I came across a New York Times uh, op-ed piece by David Brooks, the, the columnist, um, some months ago. I think it was back in September of last year. And I, I, I was troubled by it because he, he said that we're in, the way he put it was we're in sort of an, uh, well, I don't remember exa exactly how he put it, but he, he basically said we're in a place now where, where there's this sort of, um, it's hip to be empathetic. It's, it's a trendy kind of thing. Everybody's saying that empathy is important. But what does it really mean? And then he goes and he provides these examples where empathy, he, he thinks that he shows that empathy is a, what he calls a sideshow, that it's not that important, that we're caught up in something that, that, that isn't as meaningful. And he said what's more meaningful is our, is our sacred codes. He said that these are the things that really make us behave well in the world, not our, what did he call it, fellow feeling for each other. And I was bothered by that. Because I thought, you know, I've experienced empathy and my students have experienced empathy. And I can talk with you about some of the um, examples um, there because uh, 
they're really, really powerful um, and transformative um, experiences that they've had. Um, and I really don't think calling that a sideshow uh, is productive or accurate. Um, but it did, it did allow me to think about it a little bit more by, by what does empathy do? Is empathy, um, is empathy the thing that we're, that, that's going to, um, that's going to connect us? Is it the connection itself? Um, is it a goal? Um, or, or is it, is it a feeling? Is it, as he called it, just a, simply a fellow feeling? And, and he also the, called it a delicious feeling. Del yeah. It's like, it's, it's this, it's this delicious thing, but you know, it's not too serious. Let's not get too, it's not going to solve any problems or we, we need real social structures and moral structures. You know, there, that's the way we kind of move forward, I, I think. And, and, and I thought what I realized when he was giving the example of the adulterer and the drug user, um, saying that, you know, oh, we can feel empathy for them, um, because, you know, uh, because they're having this great experience. He called it an ecstatic experience. Um, but, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't feel contempt for them. That's how he put it. Uh, we should feel, we should continue to feel contempt because they're violating our sacred code, but it's okay to have a feeling for, for their experience of ecstasy. Um, but that shouldn't drive our response to what they're doing. Um, and, and at that point, I, I felt that he was mistaking empathy for orgasm. Um, because really, when you have that ecstatic feeling, whether it's through a drug encounter or, or through, um, through, you know, sexual encounter, um, there's this blast of, of, of ecstasy that goes with that. But is that what empathy is? Um, and I think he's confusing them. Because, sure, we can imagine what a drug user feels like when they're, um, when they're, when they're on heroin or some kind of drug that makes them feel a, a feeling of ecstasy. But that, that isn't what we're really empathizing with. You know, when, when I'm empathizing with somebody who's made choices that's causing them suffering, I'm looking at them as a whole person. I'm looking at the decisions they made and the, the, the constraints that they've lived within and I feel, I feel sadness for them, or I feel, um, I feel a sense of wanting to help. That isn't ecstasy. I'm not feeling ecstasy for them or with them when I'm imagining their their experience. Um, and so well, I think that it seems that what we're kind of getting towards also is like, what is the definition of empathy? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There seems to be a lot of. I, mean, I just interviewed uh, Daniel uh, Batson uh, who. Uh, has been studying empathy for you know like thirty years, and he had written a, a chapter in a in a in a book uh, and had kind of laid out how the word empathy is used. And he actually just laid out eight different ways. He said, and this isn't even inclusive. Sure. And some of them, so some of these these uh, definitions like overlap with like how some people would use the word sympathy, how some people would use the word compassion. Um, and then there's like different aspects of empathy. And then I talked to Marco Iacoboni, you know, about this definition uh, question. And he felt that there's a real need for some scholar to uh, mm -hmm. really put all this together into a coherent um, definition. Because I thought, well, maybe one definition is right and one is wrong. But his view is more like it's all part of like the same, the elephant. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to see the relationship of all these different <laughs> Uh, aspects of empathy so um sure. there there's uh that's actually why i ask about a metaphor mm -hmm. because i think metaphors can become are like a definition for a personal definition mm -hmm. so when i say empathy is like a cornucopia i'm kind of focusing on the richness of the experience of empathy that for me the opposite of empathy is a desert you know a monotone mm -hmm. sahara desert you know, mm. you're by yourself, there's no one there, and there's just no uh, richness of experience. But through empathy, I'm able to see the world through other people's eyes, so I gain all that richness. I can feel people's others' experiences, so mm. that adds to my richness, and they feel mine. And, and uh, so it's kind of like the shared cornucopias that right. we have. And so I really focus, in my definition, you know, on the feelings, the richness of feelings that right. kind of happens. And, and, uh, so that's why yeah. I kind of was, that's why I like yeah. the, the metaphors is, is just, you know, it kind of speaks to how it is that you see, see yeah. it, the word. 
And then you have to, dis I mean, really it boils down to feelings. I mean, in, so in that sense, Brooks is right. It's a, it's a fellow feeling, but it's a rich, you know, rich array of feelings. It's very textured. And, um, and it's really up to us to decide what we want to do with those feelings. We're not, we're not impartial creatures. We're not computers. You know, we, we, make, we base our decisions on the feelings that we have about things. So I think it's a huge driving force. And, and so in my metaphor, when I was pondering what kind of metaphor I'd want to, uh, to arrive at, I thought, I thought of, um, well, being an archaeologist, of course, I need to have something I can put my hands on, material culture as a metaphor, you know. So um, I started thinking about bridges, of course. Um, and that's a bit of a tired cliche for for um, reaching across a, a gap of some kind but it but it's tired because it it's true <laughs> you know people uh, peop we do we are bridge builders um, as social animals that's what we do um, but I started thinking if I wanted to hopefully I didn't stretch the metaphor too far but I started thinking about what kind of a bridge is that is it a suspension bridge um, you know there, there are different physics that go into building bridges or different solutions to physical problems when when you build a bridge so I started thinking more about that and I thought you know I like things that that have um, that come from antiquity um, because they they seem in some way to be more authentic to me than things we've just cooked up at the moment um, and uh, you know trendy things um, but but that's why I disagree with Brooks that empathy isn't just a trendy thing we've had it as long as we've been a species and and probably well before that um, so I started thinking about what empathy really does. It's not a bridge, um, but it's the motivation to build one. And and in my teaching, um, I teach classes that are designed to help students um, be, become motivated to build those bridges and then to um, engage in exchanges that reinforce those feelings of empathy and um, help them make decisions later in their life that have to do with um, that understanding of other cultures and other kinds of people's experience. So, um, so I started thinking about this: the old bridges, the arch bridges, that that were built you know, two thousand years ago and continue to be built today. And each of those was made with you know separate stones. Um, and you can't build the bridge from one side. You can do that more or less with suspension bridges, but you can't do it with an arch bridge. You have to start. You have to meet in the middle. And so I. I started thinking about that because the cross-cultural experiences that I um, that I help develop for my students um, really require a two-way, a reciprocal relationship. It isn't I'm feeling empathy for you, and it doesn't matter what you feel. It means that both of us have to be willing to reach across that 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 divide, and so that's why the stone bridge idea seemed to be a pretty good one because we've got to start from both shores. And I started thinking more about it. And, and looking into the qualities of a stone bridge. And again, I may be stretching this too far, but... I like stretched metaphors. Okay, well, <laughs> buckle up, because <laughs> here we go. Um, um, and, yeah, no pun intended on the stretch, I guess, either, when we're talking about bridges, right? Um, so, uh, so really what we're dealing with here is, um, is meeting in the middle. The gap between, you know, as we start to build our bridge, the gap is apathy. Um, because that's the place where there's no feeling until we get the connection happening. Um, there are different kinds of stress on a bridge. There's tensional stress and there's compression stress. The tensional stress is happening underneath the bridge and it's trying to pull it apart. And so that's when bridges pop, then they snap because they haven't been built properly to be able to handle that kind of tensional stress. The other kind of stress is compressional where there's the load that's, that's on the bridge can make it buckle. So you have to, when you're solving the problem of how to bridge two shores, you have to be dealing with solutions to tensional as well as compressional stress. So the way I thought about it is with the with arch bridge, in the center is the keystone. And without the keystone, the bridge can't, can't uh, resist tensional or compressional stress. It needs, it needs that keystone to hold it together. So the keystone is small but very, very important in the, in the, in the construction of the arch. And to me, the keystone is trust, because if we don't have that trust, you can build this wonderful communication. And that's how I see the bridge, really, is this communication, cross-cultural, um, interpersonal, whatever you want to call it. Um, it requires trust in the middle, or else um, it's not going to be able to resist tensional or compressional stress. Um, the tensional stress is antipathy, because we're afraid of the other. 
Um, we're afraid of what people might really be thinking or what their agenda might really be in, as we start to try to communicate with them. And that wants us to pull apart. So there's tensional stress in every bridge um, across cultures, across different kinds of divides. And as we're communicating with each other, we're negotiating. We're always in the process of negotiating, getting to know each other, making ourselves vulnerable um, as we try to, um, try to um, deepen the communication that we have with somebody. I see that as compressional stress. It's putting a load on that bridge of communication. Empathy is really the thing that empowers our desire to build that bridge. But the real work begins, and in, in some sense I agree with Brooks in this way, not so much with the sacred codes, because I I think that that can go both ways. He uses the Nazis, for example. You know, he says, well, you know, um, um, if, if it were just about empathy, these Nazis wouldn't have been, you know, told by an authority figure to go shoot innocent people and then just done it. And while they're doing it, they're crying. But so what? They still killed them. They needed a code. But they had a code. You know, they were, they were Nazis. The code was preserving some, uh, somebody's idea of what Germany is supposed to look like. So it, it isn't good enough for me to say that we need to have some sort of sacred code. If we all agree that one sacred code is better than another, sure. But I don't think that's how we, how we operate in the world. We all have our sacred codes. And some of them are antithetical to anything that involves supporting um, survival of other people and diversity and that kind of thing. So, so to me, this, the, wor the hard work does begin, though. You've got the the empowering feelings of empathy to build those bridges. You've built the bridge of communication. But then the way I look at it is, is the commerce is the thing that takes a lot of effort. Maintaining those, keeping the, keeping the, the channels of communication open, open, making sure that we really are sharing um, the things that we want to share and building the kinds of relationships that we want to build. And, and so empathy gets us uh, part of the way there, and then we just need to do the hard work. Yeah. So that's sort of... Where I'm going yeah, with that. A, yeah, it's a, it's a metaphor. Yeah, you're really getting into the underlying parts of how, how it all kind of fits together. And the part that kind of I found interesting was, you know, what is our intention for building the bridge? Mm -hmm. You know, why do we want to build a bridge? There's a, and I think you kind of, you kind of spoke to it a little bit. There's like, you know, that it's, it's maybe just an underlying uh, need or value or something that we're kind of like biologically wired that's to that's take on it. Yeah, I think uh, if you look at the work of uh, the recent, very recent work of Edward O. Wilson, the uh, renowned um, evolutionary biologist who has studied mostly the social dynamics of ant societies, but then also produced you know very controversial theoretical uh, frameworks around uh, sociobiology, where he got you know ice water dumped on his head in a conference in the 1970s for being so um, provocative as to suggest that human beings have inherited. Um, um, you know, social uh, and cultural kinds of uh, mechanisms. Um, nowadays, we're we're kind of more okay with that. Um, but he's he's he enjoys being controversial, and he just came out with a a new book, um, which I love, called "The Social Conquest of Earth." And what he suggests in that book is that um, that humans, just like ant, not just like ant societies, but have similarities in the fact that they're both use what he calls use social, which means that we're we as part of our as part of our social relationships, we do some strange things that you don't see elsewhere in nature. We perform altruistic acts. Um, we, uh, we pass down information um, through multiple generations. We have members, membership in groups that are, that are um, uh, containing multiple generations. Um, we have a division of labor, things like this. We see in ant societies, we see in human societies, we see in other kinds of um, animal societies that depend on a social network to survive. So I think, um, I think in order to do that, if you don't have empathy, you're toast. And, and if there was a creature um, that existed, some variation in populations of, of uh, human beings um, that had no empathy, I don't think they would have survived very long. Or if they did, it, they wouldn't have continued very far because without it, um, we can't survive. We just simply can't. So I think on some level, we do have this sense of needing to reach out. It's just that, you know, we don't, we're afraid. We don't know to whom should I reach out and, and what, which people or which, which uh, individuals or even animals or whatever, which aspects of the world should I, you know, step back from. And that's a, 
it's always being negotiated. It's not something that has a set answer to it. You don't just reach out to everybody who, who's there. Um, you have to be constantly in a state of negotiation to decide how much empathy I, I need to allow myself to feel and should I shut it off at some point or should I go all the way. So that's, that's a tricky proposition for us on a day-to-day -day basis. <laughs> Well, I've you know I've asked a lot of people about the nature of empathy, and some people have said that empathy is both uh, uh, a need and the process. Mm. So that it's a biological need as well as kind of like this process, and kind of the, you know um, I think there like I was saying about the definition, there's still a lot of work needs to be done around clarifying a definition, but the kind of the working definition that I, I've been using you know, from putting these different ones together, is kind of that empathy is like four parts. Uh, mm -hmm. The first part is self-empathy, mm -hmm. um, which comes, you know, through like mindfulness, sensory awareness of all, what's going on in our body that we can kind of sense. We have mm -hmm. to be able to sense and the, and the more deeply we can sense our own what's going on, uh, the, the deeper, you know, we can connect uh, to others and then and have space uh, through, through mirrored empathy, you know, through mirror neurons. So as, as you're shaking your head, you know, my body is mirroring what you're doing or having this, uh, you know, uh, emotional empathy or emotional contagion that's kind of happening through mirror neurons. Uh, the third part is uh, uh, I call imaginative empathy, but it's also, you know, perspective taking this. We realize that we're separate beings that, uh, we can take the perspective. I can take the perspective and say, oh, you're in Colorado. You know, I can think of your background. You're going to, you know, your professor there and, you know, all the things that are kind of surrounding you. And I can kind of imagine what, what you're kind of going through. And then the uh, fourth part is a uh, empathic action, which is that, that as we um, are kind of like working together, that we, uh, that with these other parts, you know, as we're synchronized, as we're taking each other's perspective, that we work together and the blocks that to action are kind of like removed. And mm -hmm. you see this in, in conflict resolution, right? Two people are like at loggerheads. They're just not getting anything done. They don't want to build the bridge. You know, I'm on my side of the, you know, you're on the other side right. and you're wrong. And, you know, there's all this. And then you take them into mediation and you start empathizing with them. You know, the mediators will empathize, kind of model it, and then they turn the disputants to each other and, you know, kind of help the process. They start, you know, seeing the, the world from the other person's point of view. And then the last process in that is, okay, what are we gonna do now? Like, how are we going to work together? Mm -hmm. And it'll be, and it becomes like what you're talking about, kind of a negotiated, well, I can do this. We can meet, you know, once a week and have coffee and talk about our problems or, and I can't meet on Friday, but I can right. meet on Thursday. Okay. I can meet on Thursday. And so there's this kind of this willingness to start working together. And when you have that smooth, you know, rollerball bearing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, working together, uh, that, that is kind of what's you know what I've some people call empathic action so mm. um mm. so that that's kind of like my working definition right now and it's, it's it's kind of a more extended you know kind of yeah yeah I I see um that's interesting I see I see um empathy as um something that can get injected into these different relationships um, um and and you know they they can happen um they can happen in ways that don't require, in some cases, don't require as much empathy as in others. I think when you're talking about, you know, dispute resolution, um, the more the better. <laughs> um, and so you have the uh, the negotiator, the person who's the the mediator, um, trying to find ways to inject more and more empathy into these kinds of uh, interactions so that there may be a successful result. I think there has to be on the part of uh, the individuals who are trying to resolve something or trying to build something, um, there needs to be investment. And so, you know, not to reduce it to selfishness, but there has to be something in it for me um, in order to do something with you. Um, I mean, I can do something with you for a while, and if I'm not getting any return out of it, um, I've got a lot of demands on my, on my time. And, um, and even if I have the best intentions, 
I may find myself kind of slipping away um, because I've just got all these other demands. And so um, I may feel empathy for you, um, but if I don't have some kind of investment in our relationship, it's it's a be- it was beautiful while it lasted, and um, and then we move on because you know life is full of opportunities. Um, so I, I remember talking with an international conflict resolution specialist. Um, who I helped to bring to uh, my university prior to coming to this one some years ago. And uh, he works on, um, you know, Middle East kinds of issues. He works with the UN. And, and he said, among other things, he said it, it, it often boils down to this question of who's, who's at the table and, and why are they willing to come to the table. And, and that's a power kind of thing. And, and in anthropology, we can never get far without considering power relations um, and, and trying to make sure that we understand how those are how those are at play. So you know, somebody, I mean, you can have a, a big industry being accused of um, doing something wrong to the environment, um, and that industry is well funded, and um, they they don't necessarily a company or whatever don't necessarily see the need to come to the table. Um, and we see that in, in international relations all the time. One country just doesn't seem to see the need to come to the table. Or if they come to the table, they don't see the need to, to ratify the treaty or whatever it is that, that everybody else who has a vested interest in it um, thinks is a good idea. They just, it's, no, it's no big deal to, to not ratify or to not show up at the table. When the, sh- when the power sh- relations shift and they realize they need something from someone else, they're going to be there at the table and they're going to be willing to go that extra mile to negotiate. So again, to me, it comes down to that toolkit. You know, is that empathy needs to be part of the toolkit, but it's not enough. It's not going to be enough necessarily to have a sustainable kind of relation. That's why I go back to my metaphor of, of the real work beginning when you've got your bridge built. You've just got to keep that communication going. And that takes all of the tools in our toolkit, except the ones that are destructive, of course, um, to, to, to keep that going. Yeah, that's... Uh... Yeah, there's a lot. There's there's so many different kind of angles to this uh, empathy that I can yeah. kind of um, kind of explore here. Um, yeah, it, it's kind of like you're talking about uh, like self interest, right? It's like mm-hmm. self interest versus mm-hmm. empathic connection. And uh, Daniel Vatson, he he has the empathy altruism hypothesis. Mm-hmm. So, and which basically says that if we have an empathic connection between each other that we do, we kind of act out of uh, our empathic concern for each other because I know how my actions are affecting you and I take that into consideration when I do an action. I don't want you to feel pain or if you're having fun, I want you to have more fun, right? Right, right. And and if you're being creative, I want you to have more creativity. So I want to contribute to your creativity However, if we don't have an empathic connection, then he he says that, you know, we go to the social exchange theory, which mm-hmm. is this is mine, that's mm-hmm. yours, mm-hmm. we're, we're going to negotiate from, mm-hmm. from that kind of position. So it, it's like, you know, for the science for, you know, for an awful long time has been saying it's all about the us, you know, we're mm-hmm. all greedy, selfish beings. Right, and that's what our motivation right. is. Right, and exactly. I'm having to get what as much as I can from this relationship. But now we're starting to hear about you know mirror neurons, so we actually mm-hmm. are connected. I mean, mm-hmm. whether you want to be or not, you know, unless right. you've got some real psychological you know right. impairment, physiological, psychological impairment, you can't help but have uh, the other person be reflected and mirrored in your body, and you might try to you know close yourself off. And that's all, you know, capability that we have. Yep. So it's not like it's just for self-interest. It's almost like we, I don't, it, it's, it's a little tricky, but it's like, um, you know, Franz de Waal, when I talk to him about it, he says, we, we have, once we have the capacity, it's no longer like self-interest. It's just being mm-hmm. empathic because that is part of our being. So it's not like a you know, really like, you know, enlightened self-interest or something, you know, it, it's like transcending right. that. It's really just being what our nature is, which is empathic. And yeah, so, you know, and, and again, it boils down to what worked for us to survive this long as a species. I mean, I think that it has to be embedded in us. Um, it has to be something that's always operating and we choose 
on some level anyway, to ignore it or to shut it off or to let it go, uh, to go full tilt um, based on um, a guess we have about the, the nature of our relationship with someone else and where it, you know, where it might be going and how much trust we have in that relationship. So it really is, a, I, I agree with you, it's really something that's always operating. Yeah, well, when you say trust, I've been thinking about the nature of trust. Like, what is the relationship of trust and empathy? So mm -hmm. for me, trust is really like a reservoir of empathy, you know, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. That trust is knowing that you will empathize with me or feeling that you will empathize with me in the future. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and so the more you've empathized with me maybe in the past, or I've seen that, oh, you, you're, you're taking my... You know, you're taking uh, me into consideration in 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 my well-being. Then I kind of relax. You know, mm -hmm. I, I said, "Oh, you will. You're going to keep empathizing with me." Then, if you break that trust, that empathy, you suddenly don't empathize right. with me. Or right. I, you know, maybe you're empathizing, and I'm misperceiving it. Right. I feel like right. you're not empathizing. Then it's like I'll create a wall too. So mm -hmm. yeah. I think that that relationship of trust and empathy is like really. Really interesting. Yeah. I, I teach a class um, that's in partnership with an international nonprofit organization called um, Solia, uh, spelled S O L I Y A. And their, um, their purpose is to provide a, a platform and the, um, the kind of curriculum in order to help students from the Western world connect with their counterparts in the predominantly Muslim and Arab world. And they do that through, um, through the internet. Um, they've developed a video conferencing platform, a little bit like Skype, only it's multi-party. And they have trained facilitators um, who allow these students, to, we, we have small groups of students get into these groups and give them the opportunity to explore any number of things from, you know, from international relations to personal experiences, bits of biography, of personal biography, cultural differences, religious differences, and so forth. And I find that the students who enter my class, um, the majority of them are, as, as we all expect and know, um, just like the rest of us, products of, of the way media represent the other, you know, to, to the world. And so they come in with certain expectations and preconceptions about what Muslim people are like, um, what Arabs are like based on movies they've seen and um, news programs that show atrocities um, and terrorist acts and things like that. Um, but for some reason, they're still there in the classroom. You know, They're still there wanting. So there's this tension, like we talk about. There's this tension where they really want to build a trusting relationship with another human being, one that, that comes from a different walk of life and, and who has a different perspective. There's this urge, this, this desire on their part. And that's, that's the, the empathy that I'm talking about that builds the bridge. It's that desire. Even, e even, you know, even when their parents are telling them, oh, no, you don't. This is dangerous. You're going to be talking to Muslim terrorists um, as part of this class. I've had a few students who have said that, who have said, you know, well, I talked to my father or my mother, and they've said, this, this could be dangerous for you. I don't think you should do it. Or they've talked to a spouse or some other friend and, um, and, and gotten the same reaction. But, but they're still willing. They're taking the courage to, to face the other and to face that, that divide and try to build the bridge across it. And so over the course of the semester, you know, I give them an opportunity to learn, learn Islamic history, to learn um, Muslim identity and how diverse it actually really is um, compared to the kind of um, monolithic presentation that they get in the mainstream media. And um, they start to open up and then through the interactions they have with, uh, with, with, through the Salia Connect program se sessions, they're able to really reach out across this physical and emotional and cultural divide and start to get to know another person from a very different culture. And they find all they talk about are the similarities that they discover. You know, some of my students are devout Christians and they come in with this idea about what it is to be Muslim. And they understand how much similarity at the end there is between, you know, their religious beliefs and, and the ones of, of, of those who they've, they've developed these relationships with. And so for me, it's, it's, it is that sort of empathy in action kind of a thing. It isn't just let's all feel good like David Brooks talks about or it's a sideshow but it actually is is starts with that desire and as you say they start to put the energy into it because empathy keeps getting injected into the into the equation and they continue it and some of these relationships that the students have with um, with folks from all over the Middle East and North African 
worlds um, la have lasted for years. They're Facebook friends. They, they'll never see that part of the world the same way again as a result of those interactions. Yeah, that, that quality that you're talking about, that there's this underlying impetus uh, mm -hmm. for students to want to connect, even though they're hearing all these terrible things and all that, that it's almost, yeah, it's almost right. like hunger. Like hunger is just this biological quality that we have that kind of is like an impetus to uh, want to eat and create, you know, have sustenance. And it's almost like empathy is like, is almost like that hunger that we mm -hmm. do have that capacity. We also have maybe the capacity for fear to, you know, want to protect ourselves. But there is this desire. I mean, you know, I spent um, after, you know, high school, I spent like 10 years traveling around the world. Uh, just kind of being a seeker, you know, just right. living and working my way all, all over. And it just would infuriate me when I would hear, you know, the politicians say it's a dangerous world, you know, mm -hmm. just creating the sense of danger and dread, you know, beyond our borders. Exactly. And it was like totally not my experience of 10 right. years. There was very few instances where it was really, you know, dangerous, you know, that mm -hmm. I mean, it was like 99%, you know, very positive people wanting to connect That's with right. me, wanting to include me in their homes. So um, I think that's an interesting, you know, quality that you're talking about, that impetus. And then I think the, the building the culture of empathy is what you're doing, is you're creating the social structures that bring people together. You know, you're bring, having this, the, uh, those conferences and, you know, all mm -hmm. that takes, you know, social, you know, I mean, it takes work to create those social structures so that so that uh, instead of you know fostering fear you're kind of fostering you know s structurally you're creating forms for connection That's to right. happen yeah and i think the an important dimension of that that because there are folks who are uh, who are still frightened by that prospect of of trust really as you say reaching reaching across and then trusting that that the other person on the other side on the other bank is doing the same is feeling the same way um, and so they get nervous about this idea of, of you know, building uh, what you're calling a culture of empathy. But, but what I've seen in my students is that their, their powers of critical thinking don't go away. It's not like everybody's holding hands and singing Kumbaya and losing some you know, big chunk of their brain that, that makes them just all feel warm and fuzzy. Instead, they're still critically examining the situation. Now they've got a lens to put on it. Now they realize that some of the stories they've been hearing aren't quite accurate representations of these people that they're getting to know personally. So they're asking more questions rather than fewer questions um, than the way they, they came in with, with certain decisions already made or certain minds set against you know, one group or another. Yeah. Well, that, that, when you're saying warm and fuzzy, that reminds me, I like to ask like, what people feel what did, what does empathy feel like? You, you've got this metaphor of the empathy is like this bridge, and you know you're kind of building it, putting in the keystone mm -hmm. there. Um, what does that feel like as a visceral sense yeah. to you? Yeah. yeah, I think you're you hit it right on the head when you said a hunger um, or a thirst, um, because you know when you're building that bridge, um, you need the energy to keep doing it, to keep to keep extending that that communication and trying to meet in the middle. And uh, it isn't a feeling of um, it isn't a feeling of satisfaction. That it's that feeling of desire um, on a deep level to to connect with another person or another group of people. So, for me, it's personally it's been that that feeling, just as you said. Well, um, so if you kind of look through your you know your your life, is there like a moment where you learned you kind of saw the power of empathy? You know, what was it that kind of was the impetus to kind of make you start <laughs> studying it and talking about it. Right, right. I think that um, I experienced empathy with uh, the natural world before I did with human beings when I was a child. Um, it was not, um, at least when I look back, I don't think it was uh, personal relationships or some encounter uh, with another human being. It was really the natural world or the animal world. Um, and so I had one experience when I, I was an avid fisherman when I was a small kid and I would fish every chance I got. I would throw a line in the water um, and uh, go to a pond near the house that was full of, of uh, fish that people wouldn't really want to eat. Um, but <laughs> if, if, if I caught it, I'd eat it. I'd bring it home, put it in the freezer and, you know, it tasted awful, but I figured that's, you know, you catch it, you got to eat it. 
Um, and so I was uh, fishing one day in a, in, a, in a stream, and I caught a sucker, one of these sucker fish, the bottom feeders. Um, and they're, they don't taste good at all. But I thought, you know, I caught it. I'm going to keep it. So I put it in my creel. And it flopped around in there for quite a while. And normally the fish, you know, eventually expire as a result of being out of the water. This one refused to die. And I remember it very clearly because I was getting nervous. I was getting, you know, surprised. And I thought, sooner or later, it's going to die. And I take it home and, and, you know, I'll eat it later on. I brought it home after I don't know how long. You don't keep track of time when you're fishing. But I brought it home uh, and uh, put it in the sink. And... Um, and it was still alive in the sink. The sink was, had no water in it. The fish was still flopping around in the sink. And so eventually I had to cut its head off to kill it. You know, I thought, it's not going to die. It's not going to suffocate. I've got to take this action and just make sure it's dead because it's, it's suffering out here without... And, it, you know, in the past I just thought, I've caught a fish, I'm going to eat the fish. And the fish dies and I take it home and I eat it. This fish was sending me a, a much different message. This fish was desperate to stay alive. And, 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 I, and it, it was very troubling to me, um, obviously deeply troubling because I remember it to this day like it was almost yesterday. Um, but I killed the fish because I, I wanted to eat it, even though it, suckers don't taste very good. And, um, and then I gutted it. I took it out and I you know, slid it open and um, it was chock full of eggs. And I'll never forget that feeling of looking at this big sack of eggs inside the, the abdominal cavity of this fish and thinking, that's why it didn't want to die. And, you know, I don't, that, that's a very emotional um, kind of um, experience and interpretation. And for all I know, I was absolutely wrong. But that's, the, that's what I took from that encounter, that here's this fish that was a, a, a mother fish you know, getting ready to um, release all these eggs in the future generations, and I had pulled it out of the water, and and you know, and and um, taken away that chance that it had, and so that really left an impression with me, really for my whole life. When I started thinking about, and that was that was taking perspective. Now it might not be a, actually taking perspective. You know, there's a there's a kind of type of empathy I think where you think you're taking a perspective and you actually aren't <laughs> the animal doesn't feel that way or the individual doesn't feel that way that you thought it did um, yet it still has an impact and and for me that that's one of many experiences I've had in my life where it's it's sort of like an as you mentioned before in, in uh, some writing that you sent me it's sort of an aha moment right it's one where you where you sort of wake up to to a kind of world that you hadn't been um, experiencing before mm. yeah so it's kind of like we're uh, experiencing someone else's situation yeah. and kind of saying, "Hey, it's it's kind of like beyond me. There's something else there." Like that's right. You know, that's right. I, I hate to say it, but I was the kid that had the magnifying glass. You know, <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> right, there you go. And I, and you I love fishing too. What can I say? <laughs> I had a I had a professor in college. Uh, um, a psychology professor who was looking for those aha moments. He did it. He was an informal study, but he would always ask students, what was your moment? And for him, it was when he was playing on the sidewalk as a small child, pulling the legs off of a spider, of a daddy, not a spider, a daddy long legs. And so just enjoying watching it try to move around without its legs. And some neighbor or somebody from his house came by and just casually said to him, well, how would it feel if somebody did that to you? And then just kept going. And he just said he sat there and he imagined somebody coming up and ripping his arms and legs off. And it, it utterly changed his perspective uh, of daddy long legs and other living things for the rest of his life. Hmm. That kind of is reminding me of, uh, I mean, this, this must happen when I was about four years old. There was, uh, we were living in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm in, in the Bay Area now. But there was, mm -hmm. I found a praying mantis that was eating uh. a grasshopper. Had, you know, this big grasshopper was like, had, was just eating it alive, you know, through yes, its thorax. Yes. So, oh, this is so interesting. <laughs> and I went and, and uh, you know, went to call my mother. And I said, oh, come look at this. This is so interesting. She came and saw it and she was so <laughs> outraged that she killed the praying mantis. <laughs> so it was like. I said, I don't understand this. It's like, why are you, it's like, you know, it just, it, it just didn't make sense to me. Kind of right. a hierarchy of, right, right. of, uh, of murder or something, you know. <laughs> you do, you do have that feeling though. You know, you think, I, 
my children have uh, have had praying mantises, and and we'd catch flies for them, and they have to be alive. And then watching it just start eating a fly alive is, it's a traumatic experience if you're not ready for that. Yeah. <laughs> and we have different responses then to that. I didn't feel like killing the mantis, but I could see where a person would uh, <laughs> might want to do that. Yeah, it didn't make sense to me. Somehow there was like an incongruity in terms right, of the logic right. of yeah. it all. You know. <laughs> At least she didn't eat it. <laughs> yeah, she didn't eat it. Uh, but it's, it's funny that it's still, you know, so many years later, it's still, I still remember it Very so clear. clearly. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay, so we're kind of like talking about building a culture of empathy. Is there other kind of ideas? I mean, I, I kind of feel like we can go on for hours and hours. Maybe we can continue to another time as well. But what are some other uh, aspects to, you know, fostering? Uh, maybe even, I guess we maybe should be exploring the culture part because uh, in a sense you're saying that cult, it, it's not really a culture so much. Um, and I guess it kind of, I mean, it's really making me think about, uh, you know, what does culture mean? And, and for me, the culture part of it is all those structures, those social structures that foster something. We have a, a justice system that really is kind of like anti-empathic in a lot of ways, or, or at least it's, you know, it's kind of low on the empathy scale because it's kind of like gladiatorial. Mm -hmm. It's like there's two gladiators, your lawyers, who yeah. kind of duke it out and you yeah, know, whoever sure. kind of wins, yeah. somehow that's some kind mm -hmm. of notion of truth, you know? Yeah, that's right. That's and right. so that's like a cultural construct, a cultural structure. Whereas mm -hmm. if you look at like um, restorative justice process, it's a different structure where people are sitting in a circle more and they're relating to each other about their experiences to the point where they really uh, empathize and connect with each other and they kind of restore connection. Right. So that's kind of what I'm seeing, you know, one aspect of culture. Sure. And then the other aspect would be kind of the, the cultural value of what we value. Like if we, yeah. if I say, this experience of empathy that I have, you know, when I'm, when I'm talking to the, you know, the students are talking, you know, to in the Muslim countries with students there, and they're, they're, they're feeling viscerally feeling this quality of getting to know people and how it feels. And it's like, oh, this feels really good. Mm -hmm. So it's saying, well, this quality, this feeling is something that's important. And I want to, you know, expand it within society, right. You know, in, within my environment, um, Right. So I guess those are kind of aspects of culture. And that's why I kind of use the word culture. It's like, how do we raise that value and how do we restructure, create the social structures that foster th this feeling, that deepen, you know, in, in society? Well, I guess that's what religion does, right? Um, at least what it's supposed to do is deepen these, these feelings we have um, and, and to reinforce our cultural values. And so... I mean, you could almost be saying we should have a, a, a religion of empathy, um, and in some ways, I would, I would, uh, I would agree with that um, because I think we as human beings, um, you know, despite the the efforts that have been that have been made in the past to um, to get rid of religious belief because it's not rational, <laughs> um, we still cling to that. We still we, we and and on a on a spectrum from you know one end being magical thinking. And the other being that we see the actual effects of, of our of our beliefs and actions in the world, and we want to reinforce the good results and 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 try to move away from the bad results, you know. And so it seems like um, it seems like to me, I'm a big fan of complexity science, and I have been for a while. And so when I look at interactions, agents, you know, interacting in that kind of that kind of model, um, new structures emerge from those, and they have their own properties, and you have to study them at that level. You can't find them in the interactions that underlie them you find them emerging and you ha and they have their own rules that they follow and so i think that you know culture works that way too um, as we're interacting with each other um, new structures emerge new patterns emerge and they have rules to them and they have they have um, reality to them even though they're constructs um, um, based on those those underlying interactions um, the but also as an anthropologist, I'm skeptical when it comes to um, the attempts we make to, to um, develop structures that we impose on things. Because if they're not bottom-up, um, they can be kind of dangerous. Take, for example, the, the Marxism. Um, you have these wonderful ideas about how the world should be. 
You know, they're based on on Marx and others' reflections on industrialized or industrializing society, and and all of the injustices that that um, are taking place, the abuses, the exploitation, and there's this powerful feeling that something's got to be done about that. And so there's a system of philosophy or a philosophical system that arises from that, um, ideas that, that allow us to categorize um, different, way, different parts of the, of the system that we're criticizing so that, we can, um, so that we can look at it objectively and then come up with these other solutions. But then the solutions come along and they're great ideas, seems, seemed good on paper, um, but then when we uh, end up putting them in action by creating a, a society that's run by these laws and, and governed by these by a, by a committee or, or some very bureaucratic kind of entity that that's supposed to have everybody's interests in mind we find out that our selfish interests and and these other things in our toolkit that have helped us also survive through time come to play power comes into into the picture so now I have power over you I've got you know, there's this great idea about how we're all supposed to get along but you know what I'm kind of finding more interest in benefiting myself down the line because I want to climb the ladder or I want to accomplish some objective for myself. And so I think we're always going to be human. You know, we can't, we can't take the humanity. The humanity is that whole mix, that whole cocktail of, of um, drives and desires and, and objectives. And so when we, when we impose a system on, on something, when we say, here's the structures you need to have, um, we end up with trouble. You know, people end up abusing that, or they end up taking it from that paper blueprint to something that that is antithetical to what the original idea might have been. Um, and so, I think with with a with an idea of a culture of empathy, really, what we need to do is um, cultivate a sense of surprise and and allow ourselves to um, to work with these cultural values to find ways to reinforce them in each other and to see the benefits of our actions as as we do in my classes and and in the things that you do um, people start to it starts to resonate with them and they make decisions and they build things from the bottom up that solve problems in an empathetic way like your center I mean that wouldn't be happening if it wasn't driven by this by the experiences that you've had and your relationships with other people and so you do have these things emerging but I think it's when we when we build intentional communities, sometimes we run into trouble. Yeah, it, it's kind of like the uh, means are the end. So mm -hmm. it's like you can't use authoritarian means for empathetic right. ends. Right. So it's <laughs> exactly. like if you use authoritarian means, you're going to have authoritarian ends. Right. So we have to find ways of using empathic means for the empathic ends because the means are the end, kind of. So you're kind of like addressing right. that part. Right. And, and I had talked, interviewed um, like Michael um, Lerner, who is uh, editor of Tacoon Magazine. He had been a leader in the Students for Democratic Society, you know, in the mm -hmm. '60s. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of talk about love. But what would happen mm -hmm. then right. is, you're not being loving enough. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and no, you're right. not being loving enough. Right. Right. And then it was exactly. like, bang, you're, you know. Yeah. And then, <laughs> so then, the, then this thing comes in in judgment. And I get it right. from my partner too. It's like you're not you're doing all this work on empathy. You're not <laughs> empathetic enough. <laughs> so then we start getting this whole thing about judgment, and then right. we're really creating a, a culture of judgment then exactly. too. Yeah. That's so right. that's right. You know, and, and and that's why it goes back to my point that empathy isn't enough. It's 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 the energy that can that can keep us interacting to can initiate interactions, but yeah, it, it comes down to all the other things about just getting along with each other and all the complications that go along with that. Yeah, if empathy is not enough, what's the other part? Are you like what? What is it? Is it? Uh... Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, I I think that um, I think it's an ongoing project. I don't I don't see when you talked about a means to an end. I don't see the end very clearly. Um, I think that, you know, from an, being an archaeologist, um, I look back at the rise and fall of civilizations all the time. And, uh, you know, you take, I, I take students down to the Yucatan Peninsula. In fact, in a few weeks, I'm going to be taking a group of students down there. And um, we do an international service learning project in a small village um, in, uh, in the central part of the, of the Yucatan Peninsula. And um, it's a, it's a Mayan village. Um, they're, they're a, combination of very Latin American in the sense of their their history and their culture and their language but they also draw a, a lot from their Mayan heritage as well and very small village 150 people and uh, 
And, you know, I, I think that the, uh, the students get this opportunity to, um, to, to go to this village and to immerse themselves in the lives of the, of the people. Um, so from an archaeological perspective, okay, so if we look at the Mayan civilization, um, we see a picture of that, that most people focus on, which is all this elaborate ritual and beautiful architecture and and of course some pretty nasty behaviors as well in terms of human sacrifice and whatnot but very, very unempathic <laughs> yes very unempathic exactly mm -hmm. um, but a very rich cultural heritage um, but when you look at it archaeologically you're looking at deep time and you see you know you see the rise of, of these monumental architecture and, and elaborate belief systems and you know celestial studies and things like that and then it looks as though it all crashes and um, the old idea was that these people just disappeared. You know, there was some mysterious thing about the Maya that just made them just disappear. Um, extraterrestrials or, <laughs> you know, something like that must have come along. Um, and in actual fact, what we see is an ebb and flow, you know. So, so human, we've been in a tribal uh, society a lot longer than we've been in these, these complex societies. And so what ends up happening is, for whatever reason, environmental um, strife, um, you know, different kinds of internal conflicts. The, the structures that I talk about, those emergent structures that happen as a result of the intensity of these interactions, just like they just disappear and it, bo and it, and it breaks down to that original unit, which might be the tribal level of, of organization. And so these folks, folks just go right back out into the, into the forest and start growing their corn and squash and beans and creating their milpas and their small villages. They never disappeared. They just went back to a way of life that they had a much longer tradition of being familiar with and all this fancy stuff. So, so I think about that and when I think about this idea of, of empathy too, I think that, or the, the means to an end, I think to myself, I, I've often come to a place where I imagine that I can, that I know where things are going and then I'm surprised. So it, it, it's an ebb and flow. So I see ourselves trying to move towards some place and then taking a few steps back. Not necessarily to, to make a direct analogy to taking a, uh, a few steps back, meaning that the tribal level of organization is, is inferior to the complex society. I don't, I don't see it that way. Um, the complex societies are very energy intensive and uh, they suck resources out of, out of human groups and out of the environment and it's, and it's dangerous um, to, to a region to, to have that happen too long in my opinion. So that's why it doesn't last for very long. Um, but I think as we as we imagine a future for empathy, um, I don't see it as being a teleological thing. Like we're all moving towards some great glorious um, goal. I think that we're just dealing with our recognition at this point in this very globalized world. We're 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 sensing, and this is maybe why I started thinking about it in two thousand or presenting on it in two thousand and seven, and why you you know you say that there was this growing sense that that there's this need for uh, for an understanding of empathy it's because as we become more and more interconnected there's this on some level or on many levels there's this recognition that we need to be pursuing this um, in in ways that we hadn't thought of before where that goes I have no idea and I'm not even sure I want to dictate some kind of end result I just feel like we need to cultivate these these um, these desires these emp empathic desires that we have and and build as we go through our interactions the kinds of human relationships that are going to foster those and maybe move us away from the um, the uh, unempathetic or the um, the uh, antipathy that that characterizes a lot of human interactions through through history. Yeah, I read that was from your uh, presentation. You'd kind of gone into empathy, antipathy, and apathy. Yeah. That was really yeah. int I really found that really I hadn't thought about all those terms mm -hmm. and how they relate. Mm -hmm. so, so it was really int quite interesting and yeah, and really very relevant. Well, um, yeah, I could kind of go on for hours, but we've gone yeah. for about uh, about an hour. Um, and uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, perhaps we can continue the dialogue at another point. Sure. Um, because I, I find this really fascinating, just the way you look at things. And it's really given me a lot of, uh, you know, new ideas and things to consider. Great. So it's, it's been a Great. really wonderful well, dialogue. I'd like to I'd like to stay in touch with you because um, I'm moving ahead with more of this kind of empathy in action sort of thing, uh, looking at the curriculum, looking at connecting students um, across cultural and geographic divides, 
because um, here at the University of Northern Colorado, as it is in many public universities, we have populations of students who don't have the, um, the means to do study abroad. Um, you know, a lot of students who can afford it um, go to other countries. A lot of times, and uh, point this out, that students from our country, from the United States, tend to go to European countries because they go where they feel the most familiarity. Um, fewer of them are going to go to places where, where the cultural um, history and the people themselves are very different in terms of their appearance and values in society. So um, I'm really looking at ways to build empathy that don't require a person to have the financial means and, um, and the background to promote um, traveling abroad physically, but instead to use more of these technologies that we have now, like we're using at this very moment, to build these em empathetic relationships with each other um, and, and do it in a way that, that allows us to have a broader perspective of our role in the world and to build um, interpersonal relationships that could last for a long time. Yeah, so what, what is the outline that you're seeing for your, your work? Are you kind of like focusing on empathy or is empathy like just one component of, of your work? Do you know what I mean? Is it kind of central to the studies that you're doing? It, it, it actually is central, yeah. Um, I haven't stated it that way, um, you know, in, in literature or, or in, uh, in the way that I market the, uh, the courses or the programming, but that is, that is at the core of, of what I'm doing here, yeah. And how do you see it progressing? One, one aspect is to bring students together from around the world to have uh, dialogues is what I was hearing, maybe through Skype group calls or uh, Google Hangouts, you know, has a whole right, right. process for, for that now. Um, well, how how well, else I, do you want to continue with this? I think that because we're a, well, not just because, but we are an academic institution. Our, our role is to do higher education here. Um, and that's, that's near and dear to my heart, or I wouldn't have been in it for as long as I have. Um, but I, I see it's very, very important in today's world for us to link our academic or one's academic training to one's um, participation in society. Um, now we're, uh, higher education is under threat right now because of the economy, but also because of a, of a, of a general feeling in our society that the purpose of higher education is to um, prepare somebody for a particular kind of job. And so when you're reading, it's in the newspapers all the time now, it's in the news all the time now, talking about what's the purpose of higher education. It's underperforming in its goal to, um, to teach students what they need to know in order to get jobs. There's not enough students. I just came across a, an article the other day, it was in the Daily Beast, um, which said, the title of it was, and I, it's probably not a direct quote, but it's close, the 13 most useless majors in college. And it pointed in the way it measured it, because it was drawing on a study that was done somewhere else. Um, trying to remember where that study was done. Can't remember at the moment, but you can look it up um, or I'll send you the link. Um, looking at um, salaries, the salary of a student who's a recent graduate and the salary of a student who's been out, uh, a person who's been out for a few years. And basing the, the, the definition of useful and useless on salary. And, you know, people don't choose majors when they go into college. Some do. They come in, I want to be a business major because I want to make a lot of money. Um, but a lot of times it's value driven. Um, this is what I love. I love to learn about this kind of thing. I love people, so I want to be a psychologist or I love interact. I love exploring new, new um, cultures. I want to be an anthropologist, a historian. I'd like, I love reading and discovering new documents that, that you know, increase my insight about the past. Well, a lot of these majors have been identified as useless. Philosophy has been identified as useless. Anthropology um, and history, among many others. Fine arts have been identified through the Daily Beast headline as useless disciplines um, for students to major in because it's not, you know, it's not paying off for them. So for me, higher education needs to regain that ground and say, you know what, we're not about finding a job for, for a person because in today's economy it's not that easy anymore. You don't just go out and say here's my piece of paper I'm going to match it up with my specialty unless I'm a computer scientist or something. Really I think the role of higher education is to turn out people who can think on their own creatively and, crit and, uh, and, and critically and can feel that they need to be participants, active participants in their world. And we have a choice. Do we want to be um, apathetic participants? passive recipients of information, um, doing what we're told, pushing the button because it, clicking, you know, buy now, 
Or do we want to be the kind of person who critically examines things and says, you know, if we just reached out, if we were just to reach out to this other group, we could build something together. You know, those are the kinds of people that I think higher ed needs to be turning out, not 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 those filled with antipathy or who are who have ideas that they brought in when they came into college and the ideas have not changed at all throughout their four four or five year experience. Um, that's not our role either is to be a black box that turns out the same person who came in. Yeah, well, I was just thinking you got these nice words. You know, antipathy, apathy, and it's also psychopathy. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like right it, because it's like if you're what they're kind of saying in that study or that article is it's just about maximizing your own self interest in right. in you know material gain, and that's kind of the end all be all of existence. And it's a little you know that, that's more in the lines of uh, psychopathy. You know, really. Right. And plus, you know, we're dealing with um, an economy that isn't doesn't have an easy solution. So everybody's looking for an easy answer, and the answer is it's the responsibility of colleges and universities to find somebody a job or to prepare them for some job that may not even exist out there. But it, it's a lot of finger pointing going on right now. You know, the state legislatures are saying um, you you're paying you're you're uh, charging too much for tuition, but the state legislature is cutting back on funding all the time of of public education. So uh, the finger pointing is going on all over the place. But there, we've lost the sense of our commitment to society to to the to the world as as active, engaged citizens. And so I, I really feel like that's at the core of what I try to do as well. Yeah, the finger pointing might be a lot about fear. You know, it's like just anxiety and fear. People are feeling fearful, so they're you know, there's there's a uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Bill Drayton. He's uh, director of Ashoka, which is a social entrepreneur organization, and he's been talking and writing and organizing towards uh, promoting empathy education in the schools, so that it's like reading, writing, arithmetic, empathy. Mm, that's and, great. Um, and he, it was just a, a paper he just, uh, an article he just put out that I just saw today where he kind of really laid out his arguments. But it's basically he's saying that the, the world of structured, you know, where you just kind of do repetitive tasks is kind of like gone because change is happening so much. Mm. So you really need to learn empathy because empathy is sort of like more like improv, you know, like jazz improv right, or acting right. oh, improv. You yeah. have to learn how to improvise and how your actions interrelate to others. You can't just do the factory floor work, this same mechanical task. And so it should be, um, you know, the part of uh, school, you know, should be learning how to empathize. And that is actually just that skill in itself is critical for kind of any endeavor that you're going to do uh, in, in the workplace. You know, it, it's a, uh... It might sound a little ironic, but I also train in martial arts, which is uh, really about um, hurting your enemy. <laughs> but but the process of training for it, because you're not out there actually doing it, you're just you know becoming more skilled at being able to understand your environment and the people within it, and hope that, that you don't need to protect yourself. Um, underlying that, though, is a real intimate sense of the other, of, of how the other person is behaving in, in space. And I think that, um, you know, fundamental to good martial arts is flexibility and the ability to adapt to new situations. And, um, and, and so I, I like that as another metaphor because it, it, it seems so um, paradoxical that you could be training to protect yourself and, and cause damage to someone else, but at the same time growing the sense of empathy for for another person in order to understand them better and understand what they might be doing next you know and and so it's it's really a, a fine line but it, it it's the same as as building a curriculum or or or, or looking at preparing students for being for, for really understanding as best they can their world for seeing it from these different perspectives and and anticipating what other people are doing in it and uh, and being able to in a sense martial arts is a kind of dance as well in a sense, you know, kind of interacting in a way that's fluid and graceful um, as you're trying to achieve whatever goals that you have. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know which uh, martial art you're doing, but I think Aikido is really one of the martial arts that's the most along those lines that you're, you're really very perceptive, empathic of what the other person is doing. You're not trying to dominate 
or you know to kind of win necessarily but trying to use their energy to kind of keep this uh, empathic balance right. and maybe come back to uh, connection so it's it's almost like the protective use of force you're using the minimal amount of force That's right. uh, just to keep from harm from being done and it's not to, you know, to dominate someone. Right, right. I, I train in Kung Fu, which is um, obviously Chinese martial art. But that one, um, the, the key to its, its uh, it, to success in Kung Fu is softness. It's not hardness. So the, the point is to, you know, you have to know when to be hard. But, but really it comes down to being soft as often as possible because then you're, then you're very flexible and you're moving with, with another person. We do this, uh, this is way outside of the field of anthropology and things like that. But we do this practice called sticky hands where we're sparring with another person but you're doing it in slow motion. It's like, the, like you're just trying to move as slowly as possible and you're just moving your hands with them. And so then you become aware of very subtle movements that they're producing as they start to change their directionality or change their intention. And you can feel it before they actually go in that direction. And so as we practice that, we start to realize in this relationship with the other person what they're doing and what their strategy is and, and how you can move with that and respond to it. So there's a lot of lessons to, embedded in that practice. Oh yeah, there, there's uh, so much to be learned about empathy from all these different uh, disciplines, yeah, you know, yeah. acting and the arts. I do a freestyle dance. I was just there uh, oh. yesterday. And part one of the exercises was people were standing in different uh, places, half the group, and they were dancing and moving. Mm -hmm. And then it was your, your, and the other half of the people would go to each person and mirror what they were doing. Okay. And yeah. then you would go to the next person and mirror. So uh, you're kind of like learning how to mirror, you know, through yeah. mirror neurons kind of. It's like mirror yeah. neurons, you know, plus kind of the intention of it, intentionally mirroring with your body. So huh. all those kind of like exercises, there's so much are these, you know, exercises that can really be done to create that, uh, you know, that mindfulness, that self-awareness and that, that empathic connection. When you start uh, practicing it, then, you know, we become, you know, better at it. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great example. Yeah. Well, we've, we've really covered a lot here. I think <laughs> we certainly it's have. like you're one of those people I, I could talk for hours with <laughs> right, and, exactly. and have a great time doing it. Um, Same here. So, uh, yeah, let's continue the dialogue and we'll end it for now. But, to, okay. you know, look at uh, maybe get some others. I've been talking with some other academics and professors kind of like yourself who sure. have that same enthusiasm. Maybe we even get a panel together. That's to a great idea. A, round, a virtual roundtable. Yeah, virtual empathy circle. <laughs> right, there we go. That's perfect. <laughs> well, thanks for this opportunity, Edwin. I really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was a real pleasure. Thank you so much. And so we'll be... Uh, talking soon. Then. Okay. Until then. Uh, bye, Michael. Okay. Bye, Edwin. Take care. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.